This DNA picks up information and translates it to the cell. It's like a quantum resonant antenna picking up information. Now, a lot of people have damaged DNA anymore. That's what's called cancer. Cancer is because our DNA gets damaged. And there's a lot of other diseases that are associated with damaged DNA. So what we've got in every cell is this little cell phone has dead batteries and the antennas are broken. Now what if there was something that would go in and recharge the batteries and repair the damaged antennas? Well that's what we think the Ormus does. It connects with this little resonant antenna, the DNA, and repairs it. And it repairs it to a non-physical template, to sort of the spirit template, the, the non-physical pattern of the internet or the implicate order. These Ormus elements also can bring in energy. Now we've actually seen this, and I'll have some stories about it tomorrow about how it brings in energy and sometimes maybe a little more energy than a person may even want. So these Ormus elements in the body would be a quantum coherent resonant antenna with the DNA to pick up energy and information from the implicate order, from the internet. Now we're, we're talking about telepathy here. We're talking about instantaneous communication we're talking about prayer. We're talking about all of the different mystical terms that people use when they talk about the connection between people and God or spirit. These Ormus antennas in every cell would in effect provide a direct instantaneous connection to everywhere at once. Now, if such a thing were true, there should be some evidence of it and we'll be seeing some evidence in a minute. So there's an incredible communication system between the cells of the body. So when the Ormus gets into the body, it repairs the DNA, it reestablishes the communication with spirit, with the non-physical DNA template that a Russian scientist named Vladimir Poponin described in, in his paper on the DNA phantom effect. What he did was he and his colleagues in Russia, and they later rep replicated the experiment in the United States, they took some DNA and shot a laser through it. But first they shot the laser through the empty air, nothing in it, just through the air, and they measured the interference pattern of that laser on a target. So that gives you the interference pattern of the empty air. Then they shot it again through the DNA, and they got a different interference pattern. That was the interference pattern of the DNA. Then, just to check up, just to make sure that they, they did everything right, they shot it through the air again. And guess what? It didn't match the empty air. It matched the DNA pattern. The second time they did it through empty air, it still matched the DNA pattern. There was something in that air, although the air had all changed. It was all different air. You know, the air moves through a room all the time. So it wasn't the same air. Well, they said, there's something wrong here. So they did the experiment over again the next day. Well, they just shot, shot it through the empty air. And the next day, it also matched the DNA pattern. Well, this was weird. So the next day they shot it again, and again, and again, and again for a month. And every time they shot it, it matched the DNA pattern. Something about that DNA pattern was in the space. It wasn't the air, because the air had moved. It wasn't even really the space, because the Earth is moving around the sun. You know, it's, it's, the Earth was in a totally different place. You know, it, the Earth had moved millions of miles in, in that month and yet they were still seeing the same DNA pattern. This really was an amazing revelation to me when I heard this story, or I actually read it on the internet. And I had some questions about it. I was giving this lecture in, in San Francisco, and uh, I just got done with this particular part of the lecture, 
and some people came in late, uh, three people. One of them was Chris, a PhD scientist at, at Berkeley, and his assistant, Masumi, and this other guy, I didn't know who he was. We had a long, dark overcoat on and didn't have any idea who, who he was, so I said hi to Chris and Masumi, and then I stuck my hand out and said, hello, uh, what's your name? And he said, Vladimir. I said, you're not Vladimir Paponin, are you? Yeah. So he showed up just after we talked about this. Talk about quantum coherence. And so I got to ask him some questions, because I thought they'd maybe done it through a vacuum. But he said, no, it was just through the air. And he said that they, they rep replicated it for a month there, and then they did the whole sequence here in the United States again. In fact, they've replicated it six or seven times, the experiment. And it always seems to work the same. So there's something in that space, a non-physical template of DNA. They couldn't attribute it to any physical thing in that space. And that physical template follows the Earth around as it spins, follows the Earth around as it revolves around the Sun. So if the Ormus elements transduce more energy for the cell and provide an improved mode of communication in the body, what might the consequences be? What might it do? What might happen? Certain tissues in the body are generally not considered to be easy to heal. One of these tissues would be tooth tissue. Let's call this non-physical perfect template the tooth fairy. We already got that term, we might as well use it. On the right you can see a broken tooth. See how it's sort of broken in a stair-step pattern there? Here is the same tooth after ingesting Ormus from magnetic trap water for two and a half months. See how it's filled in? It's no longer a stair step, it's kind of a slide filled in on a diagonal. And there they are side by side. So you can see them, maybe a little bit better view of them. There's also some evidence that the Ormus materials are reversing some of the effects of aging. One of the particular Ormus elements that has been linked with this is Ormus copper. There's some people that are claiming that their uh, hair color is coming back. For example, this fellow, that's me, that was in 2002. You can see how my beard is almost completely white just a little bit in my mustache. And now you can see a lot of dark is coming in on the edges here. Right in here, a lot more dark in here. In fact, I could see it fairly early in the process. More dark, and in this picture you can see right in here where it's darker. I think all of the, even the white hairs now are, there's kind of a blondish tint to them. They're, they're darkening. The funny thing is they darken all at once. It's not like the roots darken first and then it works its way out, grows its way out. The whole hair will get dark, and then another hair will get dark, and then another one. And notice that in this picture you can see here's some kind of a reddish hair. I'm getting a lot of red and blonde mixed in. They gradually darken but they start out as being blonde, then red, and then darker. Now, this is a colleague of mine. This was a picture that he sent me from his first meeting with some Ormus folks down in California. This was in 1999. This was before I ever met him. When I met him, this is what he looked like. This was almost a year later, eight months later. So he would started getting darker hair by this time. And then about another 18 months later, I went down to California again, and I gave a, a presentation, this presentation. And when I was done, I'd just gotten done with the presentation. This fellow showed up, and I said, can I help you? Because, you know, that's what you say when you want to be rude, but you don't want to be rude. And he said, Barry, you know me. And as soon as I heard his voice, I, I recognized who he was, only he didn't look like who I was expecting. This is what he looked like. I said, 
Can I take your picture? This is incredible.